Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to this uh, session on uh, Physics 45419. And last week, uh, just to give you a quick reminder, we went through a uh, discussion of uh, density matrices. We looked at a very useful uh, mathematical entity called spectral decompositions. And we studied also how to de define measurements. And then finally, we ended up with this quantity, which is called the density matrix. Now, today, uh, I wanted to start by give you a quick uh, repetition of what we did last week on density matrices and measurements. And I wanted to add uh, some small uh, additional definitions of uh, these uh, properties of density matrices, which we will find very, very useful, uh, both in connection with measurements, but also when it comes to the definition of entanglement and how we can actually implement that for an actual system. And then if we get time, we're going to dive into the topic of entropies, which is a way to uh, uh, quantify the degree of entanglement using the density matrices. So you will find these density matrices or density operators very, very useful quantities. And uh, we will need to go through some of these details today. Uh, I also wanted to uh, quickly remind you of where you find the material. So this is the GitHub address of the course. And what we have uh, is in addition to the uh, place where you find the weekly material, you also have handwritten notes and the video. So typically uh, what I end up doing in this semester is that the handwritten notes is something which we will have basically ready for each lecture. And then I need some time to uh, update that material in terms of uh, a Jupyter notebooks and LaTeX documents. So the um, final formalized version of uh, the lectures which we had, let's say last week, that's something which hopefully is done uh, during the end of that week. So let me quickly show you the uh, material which we are going to look at today. And uh, we are coming back to this. So we are mainly going to have our focus on entanglement and entropy. And this involves uh, first a review of density matrices and measurements and from the previous lecture. And then we have the Schmidt decomposition and entanglement. And if we get time to it, we will dive into entropy and density matrices. And in the slides for this week, there is also a, an example uh, on a uh, system which exhibits entanglement, which we will study in more detail. Now, I wanted to remind you of what we did last week. So I'm bringing up the slides from last week. You can also look at the video of the lecture. And uh, the uh, topic which we went through then, uh, the first quantity we did was to define the so-called spectral decomposition. So in the beginning of the slides, you will find some basic properties of emission operators, which are relevant for the uh, studies of the uh, quantum mechanical systems. So that's just a quick reminder. And uh, a Hermitian operator is normal, which means that uh, the operator actually commutes with its uh, self adjoint. The, um, uh, and it's diagonalizable, which is another important property. What we looked at was the spectral decomposition of an operator, and we went through the uh, derivation. Now, the reason why I brought that up last time is that this is a uh, an extremely useful quantity in quantum mechanics. And this is just plain linear algebra, which is then used again and again in quantum mechanical analysis. And in the, uh, if we scroll down here, these are just uh, uh, an important quantity which we are interested in, in quantum mechanics and also in quantum computing, especially in connection with measurements, is the so-called projection operator. So you can define the projection operator in any state. And uh, here we have the just a state psi of A, and you can define then a projection. So if you see these bold face quantities, these are not probabilities, but they are uh, they define operators. So when I have a bold face quantity in the in the lecture notes, that refers always to an operator or a matrix. If it's an uppercase letter, it's a matrix, if it's a lowercase letter, it's a vector. So you can define then. Uh, the action of uh, a new operator where we have assumed that let's say this operator here is composed of orthogonal and normalized basis states. So the J's and I's. So if you look at this state 
psi of a. This is now given in terms of a linear expansion in terms of the state i, which define a normalized basis and orthogonal. And these i's are eigenstates of this operator a. That's why we can put this lambda i, which is the eigenvalue uh, resulting from the operation of a on this uh, orthogonalized uh, basis i. And then when we do this, we can uh, continue these manipulations. And at the end, we have an expression for this operator in terms of a projection operator. And uh, this is normally called the spectral decomposition of a Hermitian and normal operator. And it's, there's a very important thing. It's actually true for any state, and it is independent of the basis. And the spectral decomposition can in turn be used to exhaustively specify a measurement, which is something which we discussed last time as well. So these are uh, extremely useful uh, uh, definitions, which we are going to use again and again in, uh, in this course here, and in our discussions of measurements for quantum computations. So keep this expression in mind. So this lambda i is the eigenvalue of this operator A, uh, and this P of i is now a projection operator. And it's something which we can define in terms of any basis. So it's independent of the basis, which we've chosen. And uh, there are some examples here, which you can look at, uh, where we define this uh, projection operators for these two states. And then we can look at the spectral decomposition of a specific operator A in terms of this uh, orthogonal basis, which we have up here, this basis uh, J and I here. So that's an important uh, property. And then uh, what we did next was actually to look at uh, uh, a set of uh, projection operators. And in this specific case, what we did was to uh, not define these operators as uh, emission operators. There's a special case which we are going to look at now, with, which deal with so-called projective measurements. But the, these operators, uh, like those which we saw before when we have the basis state zero and one as, ca as cases, then these operators are idempotent. So that means that we cannot find the inverse of these operators. The operator squared is equal to itself. And then these operators, when we look at the uh, complete set of them, they define a uh, so-called completeness relation. And uh, the probability of finding uh, a specific eigenvalue lambda of i is now given by this uh, projection operator multiplied with the state psi of a. And the sums of the probabilities are sum to one. And we could also define the post-measurement normalized pure quantum state. So pure quantum state means that it just is a pure state as we defined last time. And for the specific outcome of this lambda i in terms of this vector here, which is now the new one. And as an example, we looked at this uh, binary system states, zero and one. So these orthogonal states, and they have corresponding projections operators zero and zero, and one, one here. And obviously we have uh, these properties here, that P squared is equal to P. And uh, when we then do the measurement, uh, the probability of finding zero, one, in this specific case is either alpha squared or beta squared. And if we set this uh, psi to one over square root of two as a linear combination of these two states, by the way, there shouldn't be a beta here. Then we find that the, uh, the system after the measurement is in a pure state, just zero or one. And this has a uh, normalization factor alpha divided by the absolute value of alpha. There are some small typos here and there, which I spot now. And in general, what we have is that uh, such a measurement which we have here is given by this quantity which you see here. This can also be rewritten in terms of uh, the quantity you see here. So this is just a rewrite, the trace of these uh, two matrices. So the probability of finding the system in a state X, where I now put this subscript X here to indicate that that's a specific uh, uh, outcome we are looking after. So X could be zero or one. 
Actually, there's a small typo here as well. I see some small typos here and there. So this should be a one which you have here, and there should be a, a, a absolute value sign here. Now, the um, uh, you can uh, look at this equation, which you see here, which is a more compact way of writing it, just in terms of an example, where we have a given state psi, and then we have a projection operator. And as I said, we can define such a uh, projection operator for any state which we have. And in this particular case, this is composed of a linear combination of the state zero and one. And in this particular case, uh, we have that uh, this uh, projection operator P zero is the one which projects out one and one, the, the, the first component, the zero vector. And if we act on that one, what we get now is this matrix. And if we take the trace, which is what we had up here, the trace of the projection operator multiplied with the uh, the uh, projection operator of the state psi, then we end up with uh, what we expect, which is uh, alpha squared. So this is the probability of finding the state uh, zero, given this linear combination of zero and one here. And uh, similarly, you can do the same calculation for finding the probability of a measurement where we have the state one. And this is simply given by beta squared when you take the trace here. So uh, this allows us now to uh, define uh, also the spectral decomposition for probabilities. And uh, this is the measurement of a specific outcome. And then we can define the sum of all the probabilities, all the measurements or the complete ensemble of measurements using the spectral decomposition. And this is also a very handy quantity, which we uh, will use uh, repeatedly. So these were what things which we went through last week. And then uh, based on uh, this specific definition, which we had here, and the, uh, the, the last equation, which you see here, this probability, and using the spectral decomposition, then what we have is a, uh, a sum over the, this trace multiplied with the probabilities. And what we do now is that we define a quantity which is called a density matrix or density operator. And this is given by the eigenvalues, so this P of I or probabilities, uh, since we are dealing with uh, uh, the density matrix, this normally becomes the eigenvalues or the was of the density uh, matrix. So the density matrix is now given by uh, this specific form. We can calculate the eigenvalues of that operator. And then these uh, uh, P of I's here are just the eigenvalues of the density matrix. And we can rewrite this in a more compact form as a trace of this Px times the density matrix. So this is just a rewrite of this quantity which you saw here. And this sums up all the possible probabilities for a specific event. And uh, this has some properties which we listed without proof. And there exists a probability, P of i larger than zero, which is where they sum up to one. And then there is an orthonormal basis. So we can define this uh, uh, density matrix. And the density matrix is also a, a positive definite, a semi-positive definite matrix. And it has the properties that row zero is larger or equal than zero and less than one. And the norm two is less than or equal than one. So we can also then define uh, the, uh, the, the state the system collapses to after measurement in terms of this uh, changed density matrix here. So this is just a uh, additional definition of uh, the, uh, the density, the, the, the state in a, after a specific measurement. So take a look at these definitions here because now we are gonna uh, use them and we are going now to first add some additional uh, definitions of density matrices and uh, measurements. And then we are going to move over to a discussion of uh, entanglement. So this was a quick reminder of what we did last week. And I wanted to take this quick reminder because there are properties here which we are going to uh, use again and again. So let me uh, bring some additional definitions of density matrices 
and we're now going to switch to the uh, to the whiteboard. And these whiteboard notes are the notes which I'm going to type in a little bit later this week here. So hopefully you can see my whiteboard. So let me know if there are any problems with the audio or anything. So what I want to do now is to uh, add some additional definitions uh, of measurements. So there is a, let me just bring this up here. It seems my last small moment. It seems that my pen is not working properly. So let me just do one thing here. It seemed that my pen was not properly synchronized. So the I needed to synchronize it with my iPad again. So sometimes it happens that the, the pen doesn't write. Okay, so uh, I'm going to add some additional definitions of uh, measurements. So there's something which we call a projective measurement. So this is just an additional definition here. Because the projection operators, which we have looked at till now, they are so-called idempotent uh, operators, which means that they do not obey the conditions on unitarity. But a projection, projective measurement, that is actually a Hermitian operator. And sometimes this is a very useful quantity, which we can use. There's a Hermitian operator, which I'm just going to call M. So this is an operator instead of P, just to distinguish it from the idempotent operators. And this uh, operator A has a spectral decomposition with spectral decomposition. Now this is just an additional definition of a type of measurement operator, which we uh, may encounter when we do uh, quantum computing and quantum information theory. So this operator is now given in terms of uh, a set of outcomes. So X are the eigenvalues of this operator M. So we have a, an X and then we have this uh, a P which forms a set of orthogonal projectors for each specific event. So let me just specify what these quantities are. So X are the eigenvalues as we did previously with the uh, spectral decomposition of M and this uh, P of X, they, as opposed to what we saw earlier, they form a set of uh, orthogonal projectors. But the difference now with the uh, previous operators which we had, is that these operators uh, actually operators which uh, behave like unitary transformations. So this form a set of orthogonal projections uh, which satisfies a sum of X of P of X equal to the identity matrix. And furthermore, being orthogonal operators, this means that if I have a P of X multiplied with a P of X prime, this is again equal to Delta X the Kronecker delta multiplied with P of X. So this can be understood as a special case of uh, the previously described measurement operators in the following way. So suppose you have a set of measurement operators, M of X, which in addition to the completeness relation also satisfy the relation that they are orthogonal projectors, which means also that they are Hermitian. And in this case, these operators M of X that defines what's normally called a projective measurement uh, through the definition which we put up here. So the difference now is that you can actually define operators M, which are emission operators. 
and uh, uh, the probabilities of outcomes, etc., they are defined in the same way as earlier. So the only difference now with what we had before is that these are uh, operators which uh, uh, are Hermitian. So the traditional uh, projection operator is not the Hermitian operator. It's an idempotent operator, and you cannot calculate the inverse of that operator. So this is something which we may find useful a little bit later. So I'm, I'm just adding this as an additional definition of uh, types of operators which we can encounter. And the spectral decomposition is something which we can apply to any type of operator. Okay, so what I want to do now is to look at the composite systems and entanglement. And this is gonna be our first encounter with a, a very important topic. Entanglement. Now, what we are going to look at now is this uh, uh, composite system, which is made up of uh, uh, two uh, simple qubit systems. So if you now remember what we had before, so we had the qubit states zero and one. And uh, in one of the first lectures, we actually lose, looked at the tensor product between uh, two such systems. So what we could think of now is that we have a system A and a system B. If you're doing quantum information theory, you will often see this being referred as two observers, it could be Alice and Bob, which is the kind of normal uh, labeling which you will find in the literature. And they have information which they want to share. In our case, uh, since we are more interested in quantum computations, you can think of these as uh, two isolated systems. We could think of a system A, which now could be a harmonic oscillator well, so think of just a plain harmonic oscillator and you have a given set of states. So in principle, the harmonic oscillator has an infinity of states. But what we would do then is to uh, label the two lowering states. So suppose now experimentally, we can actually separate the two lower states from the rest of the infinity of states. And we let these two states define a computational basis. In principle, the basis which we have is an infinite basis. And then we can think of a system B, which is also a harmonic oscillator. They don't need to be the same types of harmonic oscillators. And what I'm labeling here are the uh, eigenvalues uh, of a harmonic oscillator. So they appear in this, with discrete spacings, uh, distinguished by, or the difference is typically given by the uh, oscillator frequency multiplied with h bar. And we can now define a state B here, the lowest lying states. Because again, this is also a system which uh, can have infinitely many states. The, it could also be a system which has few states in A, that means few states which are bound, and an infinity of bound states in system B. So in principle, what we are doing now is that we are creating a kind of effective Hilbert space, and we are picking two uh, states in system A and two states in system B. So we are going to simplify this now to uh, just two states in A and two states in B. So that means that we can define the uh, tensor product of uh, zero of A and tensor product with B, zero of B, and that's the same as, since we now have chosen this one qubit labeling with zero and one, this is the tensor product of one zero in system A, multiplied with the tensor product in system B. Now, in this specific case, which we're looking at, we are leaving out uh, spatial degrees of freedom and any other degrees of freedom. So you could think of this as a idealized system where you could have an electron here. And we are only looking at, for example, the spin degrees of freedom of this system. 
So you could think of this first state as a spin up state, and then you have the second one as a spin down state. And similarly, the state here could be a spin up state, and this state here could be a spin down state, which I mark like this. But these are just labelings. We don't need to, ref to think of these as spin states of a system. It could be other types of quantum mechanical states. It could actually be, uh, these states could actually be the lowest lying states of a complicated many particle system. Now, when we then uh, perform the tensor product of these two states, defined in their respective Hilbert spaces, so what we are doing now is actually we are taking the Hilbert spaces of A and cross product with the Hilbert space of B. And in this specific case here, what we end up with is this state, one, zero, zero, zero. And I'm gonna use a shorthand. So I'm gonna skip this A and B subscripts and I'm just gonna label this as zero, zero. Later for convenience, this is something which we can just label as a new state zero. Now, you see now that we can continue like this. So we have A and then we have the cross product with one. And this becomes simply zero, one, zero, zero. So these are just tensor products. So I have zero, one. And I could typically label this state as one for later usage. But we are going to, as I said, we are going to skip this uh, superscripts. And we uh, have then next a uh, one A. And this gives us zero, zero, one, zero. And we label this as one, zero. And this could be a state uh, free. And in the numbering from zero to three, because we have actually four possible states now, when we have single out only the two lowest lying states in each system. Zero, 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 one. And this is a state which we will rewrite in a compact notation like this. And for later usage, this could be in a table of states, it could be defined as state free. Now, as you can see here, all these states are orthonormal. They are normalized. You can see that immediately if you calculate the uh, inner product of each of these vectors, it gives you an inner product which is equal to one. And they are obviously norm orthogonal to each other. And that's pretty trivial to see. If you take, for instance, the inner product of one, one with zero and one, you see immediately that this is zero because what you have then is just zero, 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 one and multiplied with zero, zero, and then no, not that one but with one here, zero, zero. So these quantities are, uh, they constitute an, auto, an orthogonal and normalized basis. And that means also we can try to make a linear uh, expansion in terms of uh, these states. So you could now think of defining a new state, which is a linear combination of these basis states so think of this system now as a system where we have, uh, originally we had a complicated many particle system. It could be one electron in each harmonic oscillator well, it could be on any other type of systems. And then since we are able experimentally to isolate uh, for computations for, or for making experiments on the system, uh, the two low lying states, they're well separated from the other states. Then we are going to think of these states now as our new computational basis. So the states 1a, 0a, 1b, 0b, they can be thought of uh, as complicated many body states or just the state of an electron which is trapped or confined to move in a uh, potential and where we only are looking at the spin degrees of freedom. So this is an effective uh, uh, model and where we now have singled out these uh, states. And we are now going to look, the, look at these states as our computational basis. So experimentally, uh, this is something which uh, uh, can uh, be found in systems. And when we are 
looking after candidate systems for quantum computations. We are actually looking at the uh, systems which exhibit such features that you have some states which you can isolate well experimentally and perform operations on. And But in principle, uh, when we look at the, each of these systems, A and B, you have an infinity of, uh, of states normally. So these are effective degrees of freedom and we can make a linear decomposition now, a linear expansion in terms of these unknown coefficients, one zero plus a delta of one one. So that means that this specific state here is now given by alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Now, there are two specific states which, or a specific state which actually can be made up from a linear combination of these states. And these are the so-called Bell states. So let us introduce the Bell states because these are just the specific combinations of what you have here. And we are going to look at these states in our discussions of entanglement. So the Bell states, which I'm going to introduce is a phi plus. And if you look at the coefficients, which we have, you can now pick coefficients with one over square root of two. And this is a linear combination of the states zero, zero plus one, one. So suppose we can prepare the system to be in such a linear superposition. And you will encounter these definitions in the literature because these are some of the famous states which uh, we are going to look at again and again. And we have a minus one, one. So it means that the parameter delta is a minus one over square root of two and the parameter alpha is a one over square root of two. There is another state here, which is labeled as a psi plus, And that is the linear combination of one and zero divided by square root of two here. And finally, we have a state psi minus, which is equal to one zero minus zero one, divided by the square root of two here. So the interesting thing is now that if I measure, if I perform a measurement of one of the bits, either zero and one in system A or B, then what happens now is that that automatically determines the second bit. Now, there's also another thing, these Bell states, and it's easy to verify that. They are auto autonormal. The Bell states form an autonormal basis, and I leave that as a small exercise for you to show. So they form an autonormal basis, an O and B basis. So O and B, just to remind you of that, stands for autonormal basis of a two qubit system. So it's normally called a bipartite system. So I will use interchangeably either a qubit system, a two qubit system or a bipartite system. So if I'm now measure one of the bits of this Bell states, so measuring, and I, we will see that immediately now. So measuring one of the bits. It could be the one in system A or the one in system B of such a Bell state automatically determines the second one. And that's a very important feature. And uh, it, this is connected with uh, also properties of entanglement, which we will see pretty soon. So uh, measuring one of the bits, one of the or the one of the bits of the bell state that automatically determines automatically determines the second bit. So suppose we have a state, uh, psi plus. So let's take this state here, psi plus, 
of a, of a system A and B. So normally we drop this, this uh, subscript A and B, and this is element in this Hilbert space of system A cross-producted with the Hilbert space of system B. So we just define the possible states which we have in the two Hilbert spaces. And suppose we make a measurement on the first qubit. So we make a measurement now on the first one, which in our case is system A. On qubit, on the qubit in A. Now, to remind you of that, we have this uh, measurement operator. So let's write this as an M0. So this is going to be given by the projection operator of uh, system A. So this is the way we would define that measurement. And since we don't do anything with system B, this is just a cross product with uh, the identity matrix for system B. And it's common to just drop that uh, identity matrix for system B or system A if we're measure making a measurement on system B. And similarly, we have a measurement now where we project out the bit one in system A, which would simply be given by what we have defined before when we looked at operations on one qubit like last week. And this will be again cross-producted with the identity matrix here. So if we now want to find the probability of getting the outcome zero in system A, so probability of zero, of zero, this is simply given by P, and then we have the state phi plus of zero. So I should be a little bit careful here with the letters so I'm, I'm using lowercase letters for probabilities and uppercase letters for projection operators. I use alternatively this operator M to indicate that these are uh, measurement operators. In principle, these are projection operators as we discussed last week. So this is now given by this uh, state psi plus this specific Bell state. And since this uh, operator m0 and m1, when we square them, they are equal to themselves. So that means that when I take the self-adjoint times the operator, I'm just getting back with m, the operator itself. And this is given by psi plus. And I put a sub subscript ab here because this is a state which is now a two qubit state, but we are projecting out a specific uh, one qubit state. So if I do the algebra here, I get one half. And then I get this uh, state zero from state A. And then I have my zero from uh, B. And this is plus. And then I have my, so these are just the two states which I have. So this is one for state A. And this is one of state B, of system B. And now I have the product of zero of A and then zero A here, cross product no, with tensor product with I B. And this is then multiplied with uh, zero, zero. So this is uh, zero in A and zero in B plus one of A and one in B here. So remember now that this uh, identity matrix I acts on uh, the system B and uh, the uh, states which you have uh, here, or these are these states here, they act only on system A. So what we get then is zero, zero acting on this one and zero, zero acting on this one just gives zero because they are orthogonal states. So that means that the only term which survive here is this one acting on this and acting on this term here. And what we are left with then is just one half. Now, the thing which is interesting here is that the probability of getting this outcome uh, one, if we do that, so if I do a phi of i plus of one, that is also equal to a half. So the state after the measurement depending on the measurement outcome, 
is now given by the following. So the state after the measurement, so it collapses to the following. So I can get a psi zero prime that is equal to the square root multiply. So we would have a square root here. So I'm just plugging in the definition and this is a zero of A and zero of A here. And it has a cross product with the identity matrix of B here. And this is now multiplied by the state Psi of zero of the system A and B. And when I do the algebra here, what I get out is zero of A multiply with zero of B. And that's the same as the state zero, zero of the system AB, which we just label as zero, zero here. And similarly, if I look at the state one after the measurement, where I projected out the specific qubit one for system B, this is simply given by square root using the definitions which we had last time of one of A, one of A, cross, sorry, B, and cross product with uh, this identity matrix and multiplied with uh, the state we had from in the beginning, A, B here. And this gives us simply one A and then cross product with one B, which we now write in a compact way like one, one, a, B, or just one, one. So when I write this one, one, or zero, zero, it's always intended as a cross product here. So what you see now is that the uh, state of the second qubit is entirely determined by the measurement on the first qubit. So the state of the second qubit So if I know that my system has been prepared in this Bell state and I make a measurement on uh, one of the qubits and then I can immediately identify the state of the other qubit. So the state of the second qubit is determined even though The measurement, it has only taken place locally on this system A. So the state of the second qubit, which is the system B, uh, is determined even though the measurement was done. So you could now think of you actually making a measurement. If these are well isolated systems, you could then say with a pretty precise uh, determination that you are now measuring state A or system A or measuring system B. And that means that the state of the second qubit is now determined even though the measurement was made or has only taken place, has only taken place place locally on system A. So you could think of uh, acting with a laser on system A. You could excite uh, one of the particles to an excited state. Or alternatively, you're just measuring the probability of finding uh, that specific state. And that immediately determines the uh, second state. So this is an extremely powerful property, which uh, is tightly linked with the uh, physics of entanglement, which we will define after the break here. So I see my, we are just at the hour. So it fits now to take a small break and just stretch legs, grab some coffee or whatever you want to do. So let me just pause the recording. So when we have a, such a composite system, we can define a, a new density matrix, which is the cross product of the two density matrices. So in general, if I have a, uh, two such mixed uh, states like those which we looked at now, 
we can set up a density matrix, which is the cross product of the individual density matrices for the individual systems. But let's now look at the, before we do this, uh, introduce this discussion of density matrices for composite systems and uh, so-called separable system. Let's now look at the entanglement itself. And this is an important feature in quantum mechanics, which uh, is essential when we are doing quantum computing. So one of the uh, things which uh, allows us to perform this type of measurements, which are totally different from classical physics, is actually the feature of entanglement. So the state which we looked at previously, this Bell state, is an example of a uh, so-called entangled state. So this... Uh, Bell state, which we had up here, this phi plus, phi minus, psi plus, or psi minus. These are exa examples of states which cannot be separated in terms of products of individual states. So they contain linear combinations, and these linear combinations define what is called an entangled state. So let's uh, look at the uh, basis states which we have. So we define the state zero, zero as the cross product of uh, zero in system A and system B. And we wrote this as just zero, zero, A, B, or just zero, zero. So there are many ways of writing this. So often we tend to write in a compact way these different uh, uh, tensor products here. So when you see something like zero, zero, this is normally the tensor product of uh, two states typically. So if we now look at the uh, state like this one, which we would normally call a pure state. So this is uniquely defined. That means that uh, if I know that the uh, system A has uh, is in state zero or bit zero and state B is in bit zero, this is uniquely defined. So I know exactly what the qubit uh, state is in A, and I know exactly what it is in B. So there is nothing strange happening. This is just a plain product state. However, if you contrast this to uh, the uh, psi plus state, as an example of um, these Bell states, so if I take psi plus here, for system A and B, this is simply given by one over square root of two, and it's a linear superposition of uh, the qubit in state A and the qubit in state B plus the other state one in state in the system A and the other qubit state in system B. And we would rewrite this in a very compact way as one over square root of two, and then we have zero, zero plus one, one here. Now, uh, suppose now that uh, uh, I'm looking at system A. So this is a classical example, which is also used in quantum information theory. And then you could think of uh, an observer uh, A or Alice, which is normally used for observer A and Bob for observer B. The thing now is that Alice or system A, you cannot determine the individual state of the qubit from this description, which you see here, the specific state, which we have defined. And the same happens with uh, system B or an observer Bob. Uh, this uh, above state, which you see here, is actually a superposition of the two qubit states of zero, zero and one, one. And it's not possible to determine the individual states that the systems hold. So we cannot say whether system A has qubit zero or qubit one, it's actually a linear superposition. And the uh, this is not the same, so we cannot describe this Bell state as a product state of uh, a form where we have qubit A cross product with qubit B. So we say, no, not cross product, but tensor product. And then we say that the state is entangled. And that's going to give a definition of a, an entangled state as follows. But let's first write down uh, some of these basic definitions here. 
So the uh, uh, what we cannot do now, so we cannot in this specific state, we cannot say in which state system A or system B are in. Because it contains a linear superposition of the state zero and state one. So we cannot say in which state system A or system B are in. And uh, this uh, above state, this state, which we have this bell state is a superposition of two qubit states, uh, zero, zero and one, one. And it's not possible to determine the individual states. So this bell state is a superposition of zero, zero, a, b plus one, one, a, b. And we cannot say we cannot determine the individual states. So we cannot determine the individual states. Indiv individual states. However, if we make a measurement on let's say the state zero, then it will project out, as we saw before the break, uh, a state which contains uh, qubit zero for system A and qubit zero for system one. However, we cannot determine in which state the system is before we perform a measurement. So what's normally called, uh, this kind of a situation here is normally uh, called an entangled state. So this defines defines an entangled state. And this is something which happens essentially for all interacting physical systems. So if we look at the definition now of entanglement, if we focus on this uh, two qubit system or the bipartite system, so a pure bipartite system. This also applies to many uh, qubit system. So a pure this system state, which we're calling psi of a b, and this can obviously be extended to many qubits, is entangled if it cannot be written as a product state for any choices of the states uh, psi of A and psi and, and of system A and system B. So a pure bipartite state is entangled if it cannot be written as a product state where I now have a psi in the state A and tensor product with a state eta in system B for any choices of these states. If not, otherwise, what we say then, otherwise we say that the state is separable. Otherwise, we say it is separable. And that means that it becomes just a product of uh, two qubit states, for instance. So if you look at the, the state which we had here, the first one up here, this is a system where we would now say that the states are separable because it's just a cross a tensor product of two uh, qubit states. And we know that we can separate this out in zero for system A and zero for system B. This would also be the case if we have a non-interacting system, because then the uh, trial wave function could just be a uh, product, a, 
uh, tensor product of the individual wave functions, like we defined down here. So if we can write it out as a product state, then we say that the system is separable. If it cannot be, then we say that it is entangled. So this is an, uh, what you might call a practical definition of entanglement. And uh, there is something which uh, in this kind of systems, which where we call the system to be maximal entangled. And if we take such a, a two qubit system, definition of maximum entanglement, then we are coming back to this of maximum maximal entangled. This is defined as a state omega, and that's given by one over the square root of d, which is the number of states which we have of i equal one up to d. And then we simply have this uh, two qubit systems and where this could be zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, and it's actually diagonal here. So it would be zero, zero, one, one. If we have more than just two qubits, uh, sorry, if we have more, more than just two states, then it would just contain a, a linear a linear combination of all of these. And this is called a Dickey state. We are coming back to this specific uh, the maximal entangled state. A, a, uh, such a system which we, be ha we have been looking at, so we can now define a uh, density matrix. which I'm gonna call rho of the system A and B. And this is called separable. So define a density matrix and the system which now is composed of the two Hilbert spaces for system A and B. And the system is called separable. Separable. if and only if if its density matrix can be written as and this is a density matrix for the composite system of these two qubits. And this has a product of all the possible states which we have. And it has a probability P of X. So this is a probability P of X. And then we have the different states in the two systems. So we have a system A, which now has a state, which we're just gonna label with a psi of A. And this is with an uppercase A. And this has a cross product of a, for the states from the system B. So if we can write the density matrix as that, okay. then uh, we would say that the system is separable and uh, otherwise, if we cannot write the density matrix like this, we call the density matrix or we call the system for entangle. So else we call the system defined by this ma density matrix rho uh, AB. So the system is defined by the density matrix. We just call the system for entangled. So in general, for such a uh, two qubit system, the standard density matrix is actually the cross product of the two density matrices. So when we cannot separate it in this uh, specific uh, form, then the density matrix in general is just gonna be the 
tensor product of the two density matrices. And you can show that that is going to be equal to a sum over i. And then I have the probability p of i. And then I have my states phi of i times phi of i. And this is for system A. And then I have the product of this one with the states in system B. So this, they have probability q of j. And then I have my c of j of c of j and this is for system b you can actually show that it's not that difficult to set up the tensor products and then simply uh, calculate the density matrix for system a and b so if we cannot separate them as we have here then we say that the system is entangled if we can perform the separation then we would say that the system is entangled so deciding whether a given state is entangled or not is not always obvious. So it's uh, uh, something which uh, uh, can have different measures. And you will see this kind of ambiguity in many of the quantities which we are going to define later here. But one way to define whether the system is entangled is to compute the so-called uh, Schmidt decomposition. So the uh, Schmidt decomposition is one of the ways by which we can assess whether the system is in a pure state, uh, in a Hilbert space given by the cross product, the tensor product of uh, two Hilbert spaces. And uh, uh, we are using that as a kind of measure of uh, entanglement. So the Schmidt decomposition says the following. So if we let this uh, state psi, which is now the tensor product of two uh, states in two Hilbert spaces. So we let this psi be a pure. So when I say pure state, it doesn't contain any linear combination of many other different states. It could be just zero, zero, or one, one, etc. So we let this be a pure state in uh, the Hilbert space. So we have the Hilbert space for system A, tensor product with the Hilbert space of system B. But sometimes I tend to say cross product instead of tensor product. So if I say cross product, it's actually tensor products in these cases. So we would let a pure state in the Hilbert space, which is now spanned by systems A and systems B. We would then have the state which can be rewritten in terms of a sum i equal one up to d and then we have this um, uh, parameters lambda which are uh, acting as probabilities and then we have the state i in system a and then the system i in system b and uh, the amplitudes lambda where the amplitudes Lambda i are real quantities. So this should be an i, sorry, are real. And they are strictly positive. And what we have is that lambda i squared sums to one. So the states which we have in system A, they form an orthonormal basis. And the states in system B, they also form an orthonormal basis for the system B. And these uh, amplitudes, lambda i's, they are called the Schmidt coefficients. And the Schmidt rank D is equal to the number of Schmidt coefficients, lambda i. And it normally satisfies a constraint where this D is less than the minimum dimensionality of system A and system B. So these lambda i's, they were, are normally called the Schmidt coefficients. And um, these um, states, I and B, I in A, and uh, I in B, they're orthonormal. 
So these are orthonormal uh, basis states. And uh, this uh, D here, which is called the rank of, um, or the number of Schmidt coefficients, it's normally called the, the Schmidt rank, is smaller or equal to the minimum dimensionality, to the minimum of the dimensionality of um, the Hilbert space for system A and the Hilbert space for system B. So the proof, <coughs> sorry guys. I seemingly lost my voice a little bit here. I need, means I need some water and coffee here. So the key ingredient in the proof for the Schmidt decomposition is actually the singular value decomposition. So let's take a look at the case where the, uh, the Hilbert spaces have the same dimension. It's easy to extend the proof to different dimensionalities. So consider now that the dimensionality, and we are going to look at the proofs of uh, the Schmidt decomposition. We assume now that the dimensionalities are the same. So we could think of this harmonic oscillator cases, which we discussed earlier. And this harmonic oscillator cases is, are now given by the uh, uh, an equal number of uh, single particle states, for instance. So the key ingredient for the proof is actually uh, given uh, by the singular value decomposition. So the singular value decomposition, let me just remind you of that one. That's a central theorem in linear algebra. So let's singular value decomposition. And so let's uh, prove this uh, decomposition here. So the singular value decomposition says that if we have a matrix C, that matrix can be rewritten out in terms of an orthogonal matrix in U times a uh, matrix sigma, which contains the singular values. So I can have uh, uh, singular values which are larger than zero, but I can also have sets of zeros. And this is especially if I have a uh, matrix which cannot be diagonalized. So any matrix can actually be decomposed using the singular value decomposition. So I would have a matrix U which contains orthogonal uh, column vectors. There is a matrix sigma which is diagonal and contains the singular values which can be larger than zero or equal to zero. And then I have a uh, orthogonal matrix V, which uh, also contains now orthogonal vectors. Now, this is a very powerful theorem because it states that all matrices, even if the matrix cannot be diagonalized or inverted, uh, can always be decomposed in a uh, by the singular value decomposition. So what I can do now, I can uh, consider uh, I just an arbitrary, Consider an arbitrary two qubit state. And we have assumed that this is a pure state. And this is normally rewritten, which can be written as We have a state psi, and this can now be written as, and I have a sum over j, k here, where I have the coefficients of this matrix, C. So these are just expansion coefficients. And I have my state j here for system A, and I have my state k here for system B. So remember now that when I write these kind of notations here, this always involves a tensor product but I'm skipping the tensor product notation. So we have orthonormal basis states. Basis states. Which are given by the states from system A and the states from system B. So both of these contain now orthonormal basis states. And uh, 
there is some amplitude C here. So this uh, coefficient C, J, K, they are the matrix elements of a matrix C, which we can decompose according to the singular value decompositions. So they are the matrix elements of this matrix C. Matrix elements. of this matrix C, which we can rewrite in terms of the singular value decomposition. So we have assumed now that this C, and it's easy to extend the proof to uh, the dimensions which are different from the for the Hilbert spaces A and B. So we have assumed that this matrix C now is a matrix which has matrix elements in the complex space and which has dimensionality D times D. So we have assumed the same dimensionality for the systems. So that means that the U and V, which are square matrices, they have the same dimensionality. So I can actually write the now the matrix, uh, everything in terms of the singular value decomposition. So it means that this C, J, K, this specific matrix elements, when I now look at the singular value decomposition, this is just the matrix products. And what I would have then is a sum over J and I, and I have the singular values, and I'm gonna label the singular values with this lambda of I. So these are the singular values. I'm assuming in a way that all of you are familiar with the singular value decomposition. And these eigenvalues are always larger or equal to zero. So these lambda I's, are larger or equal than zero. And they're normally ordered in terms of an ascending series. So I start with a, a descending series. I start with the largest eigenvalue, which would be the first one. And then I just go to the small and small eigenvalues. So this is simply given by these uh, matrix elements and summing over i's. So that gives a uh, individual matrix elements when we have performed the uh, singular value decomposition. So I'm just using uh, the definition of uh, these coefficients in terms of a uh, singular value decomposition where C is given by the matrix U multiplied with the sigmas, which now have diagonal elements and multiplied with this uh, uh, orthogonal matrix V. And the sigma is now simply given by a set of lambda one, lambda two, et cetera, et cetera, to lambda D this can be actually, so D does not need to be equal to the total dimensionality. So, but these lambda, lambdas, lambda I are larger or equal than zero. So some of these can actually be equal to zero. Now, uh, what we have now is that we note that we only, we only need one index for the elements of the matrix, uh, this sigma matrix, because it's a diagonal matrix. It has only entries along the diagonal. And that means that I can now rewrite the state Psi in terms of these matrix elements. I have my sum over J and K. And then I have the new sum over the I's here. And I have this U, J, I multiplied with lambda I multiplied with V, I, K. And then this is now multiplied with the the cross the tensor producted states and then k of b and if i rewrite this one i can rewrite this now as a sum over i of lambda i and then i have my sum over j and then i have my u j i multiplied with j of system a and similarly i have now the cross product so I'm just bringing back the cross product here. And this is a sum of a K. So this is my system B. And then I have a VIK and multiply with K for system B. And this is nothing but lambda of I multiplied with my, if I now identify this as my state I, in system A, and I can multiply, I identify this one as state I in system B. So this is nothing but I 
in system A, and then I skip the tensor product symbol and just write the system system B. So this is just a proof of uh, the um, uh, Schmidt decomposition, which is essentially just a, uh, a application of the singular value decomposition. So the sets uh, I for system A and I for system B, they form orthonormal bases for system A and B respectively. And so this I and B and I of B are orthonormal states. And this follows because the components U, J, I and V, I, K of the uh, orthogonal matrices U and V, they represent the uh, orthogonal vectors, the column vectors of the matrix U and the matrix V. So just a quick reminder again about the singular value decomposition. So these matrices, they have as column vectors, orthogonal vectors. So that's one of the hallmarks of the singular value decomposition. And that means that since these components belong to uh, orthogonal vectors, I can then uh, infer from that that this forms an orthogonal basis or an orthonormal basis because they're also normalized. And the same applies to this basis here. So these are actually orthonormal bases for systems A and B. And uh, if the dimension of uh, uh, the Hilbert space A and the Hilbert space B are uh, different, then the proof works in much the same way because then the only thing which would happen is that the dimensionalities of these matrices U and V would just be different, but they would still provide a uh, orthonormal basis. So it's pretty trivial to extend this to uh, different dimensionalities for the Hilbert spaces. So this is the Schmidt decomposition. So the Schmidt composition, one, uh, you should note that this does not only apply to a two qubit system or bipartite system, but it uh, applies to any multipartite system where we can make uh, a bi bipartite cut of the systems. So that's a very important uh, uh, consequence of the theorem. And the, the statement of the, uh, the Schmidt decomposition is practical for several reasons. Firstly, once we know that the Schmidt decomposition of once we know this Schmidt decomposition of the state, we can immediately say whether it is entangled or not. If a state psi, which we have defined here, if this specific state is entangled, then its Schmidt decomposition has more. So let me just that's a moment. If a state psi is entangled, then its Schmidt decomposition has more than one term. Differently stated, a state is entangled if and only if its Schmidt decomposition rank is strictly greater than one. So that's a typical uh, way by which we use uh, the Schmidt decomposition. So if we have more than one term in the Schmidt decomposition, then we say that the system is entangled. Then uh, the... Um, if you want to uh, uh, look at these kind of uh, definitions here, uh, the theorem, the, the Schmidt decomposition theorem, is then that although we can uh, uh, have a huge space, if we now have different dimensionalities, then uh, between A and B, so you could think that system A has, let's say, only two states, and system B has an infinity of states, then we can still the statement of the theorem is then that although one of the spaces is extremely large, it is always possible to find a two-dimensional subspace of system B, which along with system A, suffices to represent a pure state in the composite system. And there's another important uh, uh, consequence of the Schmidt decomposition, but to understand that one, we first need to introduce what's called the partial trace uh, operations. And this again links us back to the density matrices. And we are going to look at this one now uh, in the Jupyter notebook uh, with a simple example. And then we are going back next week to a more formal description of uh, 
the so-called partial trace operations of the density matrix. So the density matrix now comes in uh, with its uh, full importance as a way to analyze whether a system is entangled or not. So that means that what we are going to do now, uh, the first thing we are going to look at is the uh, uh, a, sp a specific system, which we are going to uh, diagonalize in terms of the uh, a basis. And then we are going to calculate the density matrix for that specific system. And then we're going to trace out the uh, trace of the subsystems A and B. And we are going to use that as a definition of whether the system is entangled or not, which means again that the system can be thought of as just composed of a pure state. So what we are going to do now is to look at the system, the example system we are going to look at in order to introduce uh, these concepts. So we are going to have a four by four Hamiltonian matrix Hamiltonian matrix, and we are now going to use as computational basis states, these are not the eigenstates of the system, with computational eigenstates, and these computational eigenstates are 0, 0, zero one so they are not the eigen so we have a four by four hamiltonian matrix which i'm just going to call for h so we have state these states which we have defined earlier in the previous lecture now these are not eigenstates of the full hamiltonian so that's different from a constant an eigenstate of zero zero but they are eigenstates of a subset of the hamiltonian so that means that the exact eigenstate psi for, let's say, this zero, zero system, the lowest lying state, is going to be a linear combination of zero, zero, plus a parameter beta, zero, one, plus a parameter gamma, one, zero, plus a parameter delta, one, one. So when I diagonalize, what the diagonalization gives me is these coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So what we're going to do now is to set up a Hamiltonian problem where we can diagonalize this matrix, and then we can analyze how these uh, eigenvalues develop as a function of the strength of the Hamiltonian. And then we will see that gradually as we switch on the Hamiltonian, we're going to mix in the states. And that means that the eigenstates will no longer be given by just a pure state zero, zero. 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. So we're going to have a high degree of mixing. And this high degree of mixing is something which we will then relate back to the density matrix. And with the density matrix, we can then trace out the density matrices of these two subsystems. And we can use this to analyze whether the system is entangled or not. And this is what we're going to do now. Uh, we won't finish in time but we are going to pick this up again next week because these properties, which we are going to discuss now, they are important for the way we analyze whether a system is entangled or not. The system being entangled means, for instance, that if we have such a Bell state, which we discussed in the previous lecture, it means that if we make a measurement on one of the qubits, then we know exactly what the other one, in which state the other one is when we perform the measurement. So that means we can only make a measurement on one of them, and we know exactly what this qubit in system B has to be in. Okay, so let's now uh, go back to the whiteboard, not to the uh, Jupyter notebook, and I'm going to uh, set up the uh, code which we are going to look at here. So let's now bring up what we have this week, and the example which we are going to look at is an example which we will uh, consider next week as well. So we have now uh, the basis states, which we discussed in the previous lecture. And we uh, have uh, a basis state for system A and B, which are the same, 0 and 1. And we can then define 
the new state zero zero one zero as we did before. And these are just these specific uh, tens of pro no, tens of products. What we're also going to assume now is that we can split the total Hamiltonian in terms of a part H0 and a part H1, which includes the interaction. So that means that uh, the um, first part <clears throat> of the Hamiltonian, so the total Hamiltonian is H0 plus this H of I and I for interaction. So when I act with H0 on this state, this has H, this zero, zero as an eigenstate with an eigenvalue epsilon zero, zero. So this is pretty common in physics because sometimes if we have, let's say two electrons, which are confined to move in a harmonic oscillator trap, what we would have then is a part of the Hamiltonian, which corresponds to the harmonic oscillator potential plus kinetic energy that can be solved analytically. And that is normally a part of the Hamiltonian, which depends, defines this H0. And then we have the Coulomb repulsion between the two electrons. And it's actually this uh, interacting part, which gives rise to entanglement. So this produces actually a pure state, as you can see, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. Now, what I'm going to do now is simply to make a Hamiltonian matrix, which is very simple. And I'm going to use the poly X and the poly Z matrices. So I have a Hamiltonian, which now has a constant element H of X. And so this is just a tensor product of two poly matrices. And this is a tensor product of two, one poly, poly X matrix, and then the poly Z matrix. And in this specific case, the matrix, which we want to diagonalize looks like this. So on the diagonal, we have these values here because they don't mix with other states and we call them pure states. And then the uh, Hamiltonian, which you see here with the non-diagonal elements, these are the elements which then will give you a final eigenstate, which is a mixture of these states. So when I diagonalize my system, I'm going to have coefficients which now mix the different states. And uh, what I'm going to do next then is actually to define a density matrix for the brown state. So if you go back to the definitions of these uh, uh, density matrices, what we are having here now is a density matrix, which is uniquely defined for the ground state. And these are the overlap coefficients, which I get from the diagonalization. So when you diagonalize, you get an uh, eigenvector. And this eigenvector contains these coefficients for every single state which we have. And then uh, I can now define this quantity. And I can also define the density matrices for the different, different subsets, A and B. And this is um, the density matrix for A is a density matrix where I trace out the degrees of freedom of system B. And I can actually rewrite it in terms of uh, these quantities here, which is just now the overlap between these states. And we are going to define, discuss this in more detail next week. So this week, we uh, what we did was to define the uh, what we mean by entanglement. We have looked at a computational basis, which now contains this 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1 states. And next week, we are now going to look in more detail in what this tracing out means and how we can interpret it. And then we are going to look at something which is called the von Neumann entropy, which is used as a measure for the uh, entanglement. And this measure is something which we will discuss more in detail next week and why this von Neumann entropy, which is the quantum mechanical variant of the classical Shannon entropy is a useful quantity and this is defined in terms of the traces of a product of the density matrix times the log of the density matrix. And this is something which we will discuss in more detail next week. And we are going to bring this up. We are going to go through the derivations of these quantities and then see how this links with the density matrices and why this is a useful way to study entanglements in physical systems. But our physical system is going to be this Hamiltonian matrix. And for project number one, or the beginning of the projects, 
uh, we are going to modify this system to a uh, system which uh, is slightly different from what you see here, but which can still be rewritten in terms of uh, Pauli matrices. And we are going to perform simulations of that system, get the eigenvalues, and uh, analyze the degree of entanglement in such systems. But now it's time to stop here. So next week, we will discuss in more detail, if we scroll down here, uh, on entanglement and entropies. In particular, we're going to look at how we can use the density matrix to define entanglement and study entropies. And if we get time, we will start looking at the einstein podolsky rosen paradox and also the Bell inequalities. But most likely, we will spend more time on entanglement and entropies for a specific Hamiltonian system. So this concludes my lecture today.